Welcome to the Damcasters. I'm your host, Matt Bone. Scrolling through the hellscape of social media can be a, well, soul-destroying experience a lot of the time. But recently I came across the most amazing feed on Instagram from Culver Props. They are a family outfit out in Rolla, Missouri, and the head of the outfit is Elena Lewis. And what she does is nothing short of spectacular. So when I started the Damcasters, she was on the list right at the top to be one of the first guests I spoke to because it is the most wonderful feed to watch. It is positive. And when you hear Elena as well, you can see just how amazing she is. One quick note before we get going. Once again, the audio gremlins in the Riverside system reared their ugly head. So the audio on my side isn't great. I apologize for that. It looks like we've sorted it going forward. Thankfully, Elena sounds great. So without further ado, let's get into this and ask the obvious question to start with. What's the history of Culver Props and how did she get roped into it? Sure. So Mr. Culver actually started Culver Props in, in New York. I think New York it was. And it had went through a few different owners uh, and then we ended up with it. And how we ended up with it was my grandpa was a crop duster for over 20 years, and he had a heart attack and lost his medical. And when that happened, he just happened to be a mechanical engineer as well. So there's a category called ultralights, and you don't have to have any pilot's license to fly an ultralight. So uh, he just took a piece of soapstone and he drew out an airplane on the hangar floor. And and my dad and and him just started setting out pieces of aluminum, and welding them together, and Grandpa would engineer some more, and Dad would come home from work the next day and weld those pieces in place, and then Grandpa would engineer some more, and, and they ended up building their own ultralight, and they made their own VW engine to go in that ultralight. And a VW engine is typically limited in diameter to a 62 inch prop um, for tip speed reasons. So he took that plane and flew it up to Oshkosh, Wisconsin, which is the world's largest air show. And he got to fly it every morning and every evening off the ultralight runway. And one of the people who were there came up to him and said, is that the best takeoff that thing has? And grandpa Grandpa, of course, being the engineer, I mean, it was a challenge. And so he went home and he engineered what is a prop speed reduction unit. And what that did was it allowed him to swing a 96 inch prop. And that gives you a bigger column of air to pull on and gives you better takeoff. So he flew it up there the next year. And he took off almost straight up and, <laughs> and all the little safety guys are like, you can't do that. You can't do that. And he got in a lot of trouble and he's like, just had to do it once. <laughs> so that prop um, was something that Culver Props designed specifically for grandpa. It had a wider blade, a wider tip, and it was specifically designed for our redrive and our setup in grandpa's airplane. So he called to order one. And they said that they had went out of business. We're just, we're done. We're out of business. And he said, but I really need that prop. And so um, he talked to my dad and they said, well, we had this much money in the bank account. Would you take that? Would, would that be enough to buy your business? We know it's not enough, um, but would it, it's better than nothing. Would you guys consider it? And they said, yeah, that'll do it. So they put everything in a tractor trailer and trucked it down from Pennsylvania in an 18-wheeler, stayed for a week, taught dad and grandpa how to make props, and now we're prop makers. <laughs> that's fantastic. So, okay, so that, that's your dad and your, your grandpa. How did mm -hmm. you get into it? Because, you know, you, let's, let's face it, you don't seem the typical prop-making type. <laughs> to, to make it, to start it's, this podcast with an incredibly sexist comment. <laughs> no, no, it's perfect. Um, so actually, I mean, thankfully, working on a farm, 
you know, you just do work. Like grandpa did not care who you were, if you could hold a wrench or, or whatever you worked. So thankfully I had a family who, who didn't care. You know, they're just like, just, just go, go work, go work and be productive. So anyway, um, I, Went to college away from home, and I didn't like it. Uh, I love my family. I love being with family. So I moved back here. I finished my associates in business, and in between college classes, I would come to the shop and work, just sweep or whatever it was. And then Grandpa had carpal tunnel surgery done on his wrist, so I helped quite a bit doing the things that he needed done, you know, wrenching and stuff like that. And I just kind of kept working my way into it, and. It was nice because I was with family all day. I had always helped with the airplanes, you know, even since I was like eight years old. While Grandpa was designing all these different airplanes, we would help cover them. We would, all the kids would sand. I mean, covering airplanes is, I mean, one of my favorite things. I actually really love that because it's kind of like crafting. And I love to craft. I crafted a lot when I was little. So these are kind of like craft projects that are productive, you know, that actually serve a purpose and they're productive. And and so it was, I just kind of fell into it. And then I got married, had my kids and Grandma and Grandpa were at the shop every day. My dad was at the shop every day. So having the kids at the shop, it all just worked out really well. And then as I progressed more into it, turned out turned out to be a good prop maker. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, you just kind of like you get really sucked into it. These people spend so much time on their projects and their airplanes because we do props for home built. So they they spend hundreds of hours on their project and then then you get to make a prop that finishes it off the tip color that matches their airplane the profile that looks good on it maybe staining it a darker color because it's a more of a vintage design and so I just really really loved that part also like you know you have wood and wood grains and matching the wood grains so that they complemented each other and and that was one of my favorite parts is I could do all that and just really help their build come together. That's probably, you know, one of my favorite parts is knowing how much work because we have built our own airplanes. I know how much work, blood, sweat, tears, agony <laughs> <laughs> that comes from building your own plane. And so I loved being able to make them a prop that fit their plane instead of just a cookie cutter prop that, um, that they would get. So that's, I, that's probably the part that is absolutely love is knowing the story, hearing about their build, all that kind of stuff, and then getting to make a prop for them for that. So grandpa taught me all the technical stuff. I had all of, you know, some design stuff that I added to it. And it's, it's a very fulfilling job to have and still get to be connected with the whole family. And um, grandpa ended up, uh, he died in 2016. It was kind of a sudden thing. We didn't expect it. And so um, he still worked at the shop. He worked at the shop all day, every day, six hours a day. And then he was home working on the farm that day. And, um, and so then it was just like nothing, you know, so that was super, super hard. Um, and then my dad and my husband, who were kind of working at the shop with us, they ended up getting jobs in concrete, just opportunities that they couldn't pass down. Uh, so they ended up going and taking those jobs. And then that, that left me here at the shop by myself in about 2018. So about 2018 is when they were just like, okay, well, you know, if you want to do it, here you go. And I'm like, yeah, I'm, I want to do it. So here we are making props, keeping grandpa's legacy alive. And, and yeah, that's how, that's how I got here <laughs> specifically. That's, that's, that's wonderful. And I'm you know, sorry, sorry. Oh uh, yeah. Yeah. But what, what, a, what a legacy to keep going. That is, that is wonderful. It really is. It's a privilege to be able to keep someone's legacy alive. I mean, Mr. Culver's and grandpa's together. I mean, it's it's a wonderful thing to carry on. Right. Let's get down to brass tacks here. What is a propeller? Because everybody knows what a propeller is, but there's a lot more to it than the spinny thing on the front of the back of an airplane. So what is a propeller? 
Well, I mean, they they call it an air screw because that's literally what it does. It just pulls you or pushes you through the air. Um, but yeah, that's just what it does. It's it's the part you need. <laughs> Very important. Okay, so now that we've got that down, so our listeners are all on the same page. Um, you alluded to it a minute ago. I was really wanting to know what the process is, sort of as we go through as as we. Look at these hats. Never done a hard day's work. What do you go through? You say you start talking to the owners of the aircraft. You start understanding what they're doing. How does that then lead you into the first parts of the craft? Yeah. So you you talk to your customers because that is what I do. I do um, custom built propellers. So if a customer has trees at the end of their runway, they need better takeoff performance and I'm going to lower their pitch so that they have better takeoff and very better climb. And then if they say, I go on a lot of trips and I want speed, then I will uh, raise their pitch and give them a little better speed. They won't have as good a takeoff, but that may, that's not important to them. Speed is more important to them. So I get to go through and really customize it to that. So I need to know what their airplane is. I need to know what engine they have on it what kind of expectations they have. Um, I do take some things into consideration. Weight generally isn't one of them, but sometimes I find out that if something is overbuilt or super heavy, they'll say, I'm not getting the same speed as my buddy's getting. Well, you added all the extra goodies to yours and it it weighs a little more and you can't go as fast. (laughs) So things like that. And having a good understanding about just uh, most of the airplanes that I build for, like knowing the engines and knowing the aircraft and knowing the expectations myself so that I know if my customer's expectations are reasonable or not. That's another big part. Someone may tell me they want 100 miles an hour. Yeah, but your plane's rated for 80. (laughs) So (laughs) let's adjust this a little bit, you know. So it's a lot of people, you know, will ask me what makes a good propeller. And a lot of it is experience. Um, Experience, which is what dad and grandpa, I still consult my dad a lot on, hey, dad, can this guy really get 80? Or, (laughs) you know, whatever it is. Because uh, knowing the airframes and the engine combinations and that experience is where um, the next level of making a prop comes in. So those are the things that I need to know whenever I talk to them. So when we say custom, we really mean custom. It's designed specifically for whatever combination of of, oh, it's so cool, of aircraft that, <laughs> that the, the builder has made. So it, it really goes, you take it to that level. Well, yes, it's true. And because these are, most of mine do go on home built. So they really are custom. So I, let's just say I do a, I build most of the props for aerodrome aeroplanes kits and they have a triplane. Well, on that triplane, they can put a Werner radial. They can put a Rotec radial. They can put a Lycoming. They could put a VW. They could put all those different engines on that. And all of them will run different RPMs. They'll give them a little bit different speeds and things like that. And so the combination is absolutely endless in home builds because they can put any engine on any airframe almost. And the possibilities are just endless. <laughs> so you mentioned this are different pitch for sort of takeoff performance, cruise, overall speed. Mm-hmm. For those elements there how many degrees different are we talking about in a in a propellant's pitch or say outright speed versus takeoff performance because you don't want to end up in the hedge in, in your neighbor's hedge probably <laughs> right so um a few things there uh when i talk about props i'll say let's just say for an o290 going on a sop with camel that's 145 horsepower. I'm going to build you an 82 by 38. And that's an 82 diameter by a 38 pitch. And pitch is, it's inches of pitch. And that means for every single rotation of that propeller, your airplane is theoretically going to go 38 inches forward, assuming no slip, no drag, things like that. So 
when we talk about propellers, we generally talk in pitch. A lot of people do talk in degrees, but degrees is actually the angle of the blade. And then you use that angle of the blade to get your inches of pitch. Uh-huh. So <laughs> that's a, it is something that people tell me it's a 38 angle. 38. And they're like, well, it's actually 38 pitch (laughs) because your angle is going to be in degrees. So, but basically you want to reach max RPM on takeoff and you want to be able at full throttle to hit max RPM. That's how I know if I'm pitch strike generally full throttle should give you max RPM. Um, And then if I'm off on that, let's just say a customer says, I'm about 200 RPM short of max RPM. Then it's about 100 RPM per inch of pitch. So I will drop his pitch two inches of pitch and he will gain 200 RPM to get him to that max RPM. And by the same token, if he tells me, I'm pushing it close to 200 RPM over red line, then I'll back his pitch off two inches of pitch. So I can re-pitch a prop. I can take it down about two inches of pitch um, by just sanding it out of it. Other than that, I like to remake it because I feel like I get better, solider numbers by just remaking it. And most props I can resell as decorative, actually. My decorative props are are in high demand, which (laughs) almost selling for as much as real props, actually, because uh, people love that for for some reason. And um, so that that has allowed me to be a a better business person for my customers, because I can say, actually, I'm just gonna make you a new one, because I know I can get get rid of this used one. (laughs) So it's been great. That's fun. So I'm I'm gonna come back to Tip speed and noise because we can, we can get slightly environmental on that. But let, let's let's talk about what goes in. Now, is it you find a nice bit of wood and you start trimming it down, or are you making composite sort of propellers as well with different wood types for different elements within it? I'm assuming it's a little bit more than just finding a nice bit of wood and starting to chisel it away. <laughs> yes, you are correct. <laughs> So I like to use maple, maple, hard white maple is my go-to. Um, also birch is a very nice wood. It tends to have some hairline cracks in it in some parts of it. So you have to be very careful with that. I'll generally, um, use about half of what I get. So, uh, I don't, I don't use it as much, but it's a really beautiful wood. And then I use mahogany. So those are the ones that I, I keep on hand at all times. So if something is going to do aerobatics or something like that, I do solid maple, no questions asked. But if it's going to be on just your normal airplane, then I I can do maple and mahogany. I can do maple and birch. I can do solid birch. I can do solid maple. I can do solid mahogany. And that's all going to be based mostly on customer preference. Um but a lot of times it gets referred back to, like I said, I love World War One aircraft and most of your German aircraft had a propeller built by the Axel company. And that was iconically light and dark laminations. So whenever I have a triplane or any kind of German prop, then I do try to go with the light and dark lamination. So it looks period specific for that plane, which really like I said, just sets it all of the builder's hard work off and really adds that last little bit to their plane, which I'm so happy I get to do for them. <laughs> Those German pops are beautiful. You see them in, in the photographs. And you've got a plane that's like, yeah, you know, like your kids painted it. And then at the front, there's just this beautiful. We, yes. we're, 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 we're getting very geeky. <laughs> <laughs> so, I've got books on it. I've got books and books on all German propeller makers <laughs> from World War One. <laughs> I, I have I have friends who want to come visit just to go through your library. Um, yes. <laughs> so w- once you've got your wood, what what's the next step then? What what do you do? You, you've done you've done the math. You understand what you need to put into it. When do you start cutting? So I will, um, like I said, that's the first thing I do. So I'll inspect the wood for absolutely no defects at all, no nicks, no knots, no anything. They are absolutely perfect boards. 
And then I have a template. I'll lay that template that coordinates to the pattern that I've picked. So I'll pick a pattern that is either period specific or um, that I know will work well with that setup. And then I have a template. I put the template on the board, trace it out, then I'll cut it out on the bandsaw. So I will cut each board out individually and then I glue them up. And we do three quarter inch laminations. So they're a lot of wood. Some props that you'll see have very, very thin laminations. We like more wood than glue <laughs> on our props. And of course, because wood's beautiful. And, and so that's what we use on ours. And they have to stay, we have a press that puts about 80 PSI on it for 14 hours is how long it has to stay in the press. So that means I only get to glue up about one a day. So this is a very, um, very individual process <laughs> to make these props. So one a day is about what I get glued up. But then um, after I come in the next day, take it out of the press and then start the next part of the process. We're just going to take a short break for a quick message from our friends. Hello there, I'm Matthew Moss from Fighting on Film, the podcast for war movie fans. From the beaches of Normandy to the days of chivalry and swords, if it's been captured on film, we aim to cover it. Featuring top guests from the world of entertainment, historians and industry insiders, we bring you a unique look at the films from our favourite genre. Listen wherever you find your podcasts or find us at fightingonfilm.com. And we're back with Elena Lewis discussing the arts of making wooden propellers, and we've gotten to the magical lathe. So this is the bit that I think is the one that if I'm ever in a bad mood, I'll fire up your insert and just and, and watch your lathe start doing doing it. Doing oh it. wow! Because <laughs> I I find that the most amazing thing ever. As, as someone who has got no craft or artistic skill whatsoever. <laughs> To, to see what you do is that, but there, there's just something about that bit of wood turning and the propelling shape coming out for the however many seconds you tease us with it. it, <laughs> it it's just, it's just wonderful. And so you, you, you've had, you've had this bit of wood in the press 40 hours overnight uh, uh, all the, over the day. And then you, then you start walking away. I'm guessing that's reading off of your temple. Is that how much it? Yes. So I will have a blank on top. We have about 300 patterns. So I'll pick one of those 300 patterns. It goes on top. Then I put my blank of wood on the bottom and it kind of just corkscrew spirals its way down the blade and cuts that shape out. Um, exactly actually. So it takes about 30 minutes per blade and I'll cut one blade, a rough cut over cut it. And then I'll turn it around and cut the other blade. And the reason I do that is because I want to keep my blades like somewhat balanced. Otherwise, I I final cut this one and then it kind of, you know, the machine will shift a little bit with that heavy weight on the other side. So I do rough cut on both sides and then I'll come back and do a final cut. And when I do that, um, my patterns are very close, but I do need to fine tune it at the end to be the exact pitch that the customer needs. So... It's not very scientific, but I take a little shim and I put it under the hub <laughs> and, and that's how I adjust the pitch and I'll get it, you know, cl I'll take the, the adjustment and bring it closer to the exact size it should be every time. So I'll make a pitch adjustment and lower the blade, make a pitch adjustment, lower the blade. So I have about five tries to get my pitch right before I'm done. And then it is what it is. Um, but that's, it's not, it is not super complicated. It's very simple. Of course, my grandpa always said, one of the hardest things you can do is make something simple. <laughs> it's actually quite difficult. <laughs> yes. I, I, you sort of get that, that it's set up to work because there's been a lot of effort to put it, putting it in to get it just, mm -hmm. just right. So once it's off there, I guess it's, it's working away with the sander. Yes. So after it comes off of the lathe, then it's um, bandsaw work for the hub, 
which is actually some of my favorite part. It took me a really long time to be able to be good at that. I have gashed a lot of hubs. <laughs> um, <laughs> Dad and Grandpa made me make decorative propellers before I could sand a real one. So I could glue props up and I could clean and I could do all that. But I did not get to sand until I had made, I don't know, 50, 100 little decorative props <laughs> before they let me do that. So anyway, bandsaw, cut all the extra off. Then I, yeah, it's just sanding. It's, it's sometimes four or five hours of sanding, um, which is where all my audio books come in. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so, but it's actually quite, and all you're doing is just taking the lines out. The machine got it pretty much where it needs to be. And so I just have to sand those lines out and not, um, you know, mess up the pitch. Uh, my my flight instructor, he when I would come in for a landing, he'd go, you got a real good setup here as long as you don't screw it up. And that's about what you're doing here. <laughs> you, you've got a real good setup with it coming off that late as long as you don't screw it up sanding. So um, you just sand it out. And, and then after you get most of the lines out, you're going to come back and you're going to balance. And then you're going to come back and you're going to sand more. And then you're going to go back and you're going to balance. And then you're going to come back and sand more. And you, this balancing may take two hours. But when I'm done, it's perfect. I mean, perfect. We're talking not, oh, it's close. Oh, that's good enough. Like, it can sit there all day long and not move because it's perfect. <laughs> that's fantastic. And, and that's going to play straight into performance and engine reliability as well if you're not putting vibration back to the, the, the option. Right. So if you have a vibration and it's coming from your prop, you're out of balance vertically or horizontally, you're possible or possibly out of tracking, or you've got a different pitch on your blades. So one blade is pitched one way, one blade's pitched the other. Those are generally the three things that'll cause you vibrations on your prop. So if you happen to get a vibration, check those three things. <laughs> we need to go back to, to tip speed because the thing I always remember from doing the, the, the plain stuff that that's good. That mm -hmm. for that. Uh, tip noise equals loss loss of power, which also can lead to vibration. So right. when, when you're working on all of those sorts of things, what sort of considerations is going into that? Especially nowadays when people don't like noise. So is is there something? Because I'm assuming the more powerful the propellant, so more powerful, the more speed a customer's after this, it's going to be slightly more noisy than one that's going for cruise. Or is that wrong? How does noise come into it? Which is the easier question, which I should have gone with right away. <laughs> no, that's perfectly fine. So, um, yes, tip speed. Uh, Grandpa liked to have 800 being kind of your max. It starts to get noisy over 800 feet per second. Now, I we do have people that say, I want all that diameter for that takeoff. And Grandpa would say, well... If you went like 850 and it was only for takeoff for short distances, I guess that wouldn't be too bad, you know, and he'd give there for 850. But at 900, you're inefficient. And so I do have, I would have people that would come and say, yeah, but I want it longer. And I'd say, then go to somebody else because I won't do it. <laughs> so um, it's, you just become inefficient. That's, that's just all there is to it. So, um, and I'm sure it's harder on your, on your prop and the longevity of it. And it's just not something that I'm interested in doing. I can't see it giving you a type of advantage that would be worth the rest of it. So, um, I like 800 as a max. I will do 850 if you know, cause like I said, some of my guys and just they want that longer prop for the look because it looks right on their plane, and I'm a sucker for that. So <laughs> I'll I'll go ahead. It, just but I do not do not go above 900 ever. That's really interesting that you know your craft, so therefore you're not going to push the boundaries. Someone come back and say it was terrible, and you're yeah. like. Well, Yes, I don't want anyone to have a terrible experience. It's not it's not good for either of us. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a wonderful picture of you from the Smithsonian magazine with the Bristol fighter propeller. Now that's 
massive. <laughs> it looks massive. And I've I've seen one or two Bristol fighters. It's a big thing. It's big. It's powerful. It's heavy. How did you get that commission? Which Bristol fighter is it for? Oh, and what was that like? It was. I learned a valuable lesson on that prop. So I'll tell you the story because, well, no reason not to. Anyway, um, <laughs> my my dad says I overshare, <laughs> but but um, we're on a podcast. You're the star. Share away. <laughs> um, the nice guy who I believe the fuselage is an original Bristol fighter fuselage and he's working on the rest of it. Now I haven't talked to him since I gave him the prop. I know the, it was a project and I'm sure it's still in process. Um, but he sent me the email with all the stuff and he put it nine foot zero inches. And when I looked at that, I was so focused on getting the design right and the profile right and doing, you know, my best job for this guy. He was sending me decals. It's for original. I'm like, this is my chance. I don't want to screw it up. I want to do so good. And I want it to be just perfect. And I probably did three or four different designs on it. And I'm just, you know, agonizing over every inch of this thing. And I, and I sent it to him. And he said, we have a problem. And I said, what's the problem? And he goes, you made it 90 inches, not nine foot, <laughs> zero inches. <laughs> I said, that is a problem. <laughs> and so <laughs> I still have that prop. I keep that 90 inch prop with me to, <laughs> to remind me to look at everything very carefully. <laughs> now, like I said, luckily it's a project that they were it was not a problem. So then I got to remake that pattern <laughs> longer and better. And I learned valuable lessons from that. And what, what, what's a foot and a half between friends? <laughs> I tell you what. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> well, I, I take that 90 inch one to air shows and, <laughs> <laughs> and I just keep it as a lesson learned, a reminder. Um, but it is, uh, it was one of my favorite projects because I did learn so much and, and got to research about the Bristol fighter and learn and just really, it was a new profile for me. It was actually the first prop design I had made, um, of that size without grandpa. So there were, I mean, I had to pull out all the tricks. It was actually much bigger than our lathe could handle, so I had to do some extra stuff, some some things that were unconventional, things that my dad looked at me and was like, Elena, I don't think that that's the way you do that. And I'm like, come back in in a little bit. And and it all worked and it 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 went well. But so I learned a lot. It was it was a growing experience for me in a lot of ways. And so it is one of my my best stories. <laughs> Let's leave that on from a dream project to the dream project, which also I, I've read about. And I'm, I'm intrigued to this. One. So it's a prop for an Albatross D7. Yes. Why that specific one? Because that is an aircraft with a beautiful profile. Yes. But why, why that one? So every year when I go to Oshkosh, Kermit Weeks usually brings his to Oshkosh. And and I think it is because it does have the wooden outside of it. You know, like you can see the wood grain on the outside. And I just fell in love with it. And it's one of those that you just took pictures of it year after year after year. I mean, I have 100 pictures of it just because you just you, you just keep every time you walk by, you had to take a picture because it's just a gorgeous, beautiful plane and the profile. And and I just I'm like, I wrote it down in my journal, I'm gonna make a prop for an albatross. And then one of the other things I had written down in my journal is to make a prop for old Rhinebeck. They're, you know, iconic for keeping a aviation history alive. And they called me and asked me to make a prop for their albatross. <laughs> Ooh. So I got to make a prop for their albatross and they fly it at their air shows at their place. And it was just one of those things where it's like, gosh, I can't believe that happened. <laughs> That's wonderful. I yeah, I, I jokingly put in saying why not something 
bit of town because of being here and being a racing fan as well. If it's not W.O. Bentley, what's, what's the point? But that is, that is what we, you, you said you've done, you've done softwares and things like that. Yeah. But between the two, because you know, softwares radio, the Elkjoss got the inline engine in it. What impact does, does that have on those sorts of aircraft? Because the, the two of them, very, very different flight characteristics. What would you balance off between the two? So basically, I'm just looking at at horsepower, at RPM, really, without knowing much about an engine, what it looks like, any of it, by the RPMs, and the I'll take the cruising RPM and cruising mile per hour, the max RPM, the max mile per hour, and each of those will give me a pitch. And if they both give me the same pitch, then I know that I've got the right thing. And so actually, the type of engine, I mean, sometimes it has to do with the air profile. So some of your, um, like your World War I aircraft, something like the Super Scarab, has a lot of torque to it. It's a, it's a very powerful engine, and you need a big wide blade to help absorb all that. So generally, most of your your older engines, your World War One engines are lower RPM. So if someone tells me that they have a max RPM of like 1700, I'm like, ooh, you're vintage, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and I know that I need a big wide blade to absorb that horsepower as opposed to today's modern day engines that like a Rotex is screaming at 6,000, like at 6,000 RPM, screaming its little head off. You got to give it a, a smaller blade that it can turn. So those are kind of the differences there. So your your more vintage antique engines are generally going to have a lot of power behind them that needs a wider blade to absorb that. So let's move this into the modern world. I am blown away by the craft, the care that goes into it, into what you do. Most of the things I hear from people is 3D printing, computer at the manufacturer things like that is i i can see your face here <laughs> dear listener it's 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 a it's a smile and a grimace now i brought this up from from what you've said there's uh there's a love that goes into these aircraft that would bring someone to a custom pop that you would do yeah you know is 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 there, is there i don't want to say is there a worry but that that sort of is there encroaching technology in it maybe technology that you'd look forward to using um, but is there a sort of, I keep coming back to worry, but do you worry about computers? They say talking over one. Sure. Um, no, actually. So here's the deal. To, to CAD something out takes a long time. And because almost every single one of my designs are different, the time it would take to CAD every single thing that I have out and then change it again for one inch of pitch here or one inch of pitch there, I mean, it would just be, oh, it would be brutal. Um, so I can change it by putting a little 50 thousandths aluminum shim under the hub and I'm done. Like I've already done it. It's, <laughs> while someone's still catting, I'm like, here, stick this under here. We're good. <laughs> well, someone's still catting, you can go. There's your propeller. Yeah, but I, and I think there is a place for catting. There are props that people ask me to make, and I'm like, that really, someone with a CNC machine can do this for you. You know, like this isn't this isn't my area. So I believe that there is a place for it. There's a place for it, especially you know people who have wooden props that are certified and they sell a ton of them. You know, and they're they're part number props. They're part number props. They're the same every time. Every These airplanes have to have it. But yes, there is definitely a place for 3D and CAD and things like that. But when people, um, I get that a lot on Instagram. I'm sorry, but you should really have a CAD machine. And I'm like, oh, I'm sorry, but you don't quite understand the whole situation here. <laughs> so... If, if you'd had a CAD machine, we would be speaking. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's a, there is a place for it. It's just not for what I do. And I do enjoy the way I do it. I do enjoy the, my, my machine can make 
take a right-handed pattern and make a left-handed prop off of it if I need it to be. It can cut it 50 thousandths thicker. It can cut it 50 thousandths thinner. It can change the pitch 10 inches up or 10 inches down. I can shorten a prop. I can lengthen a prop. If my prop needs more um, thickness within the hub, I hand taper the hub so that it's thicker in that neck wrist area so that, you know, because that engine has a little extra horsepower than I anticipated. If it needs to be something else, I can thin it down. I can make so many adjustments instantly on it that it works perfectly for the area of propeller making that I'm in. So you get advice over Instagram. Uh, I, um, I thought I should probably do a whole YouTube channel on taking their advice and what that would end up looking like. <laughs> <laughs> show the absolute disaster that would come from some of these suggestions i think it would be hilarious <laughs> some people are genuinely kind though some people i do i have they'll they'll tell me about a tool or something and i'm like oh my gosh i can't believe that i i've that's the best thing that's ever happened to me or i'm like this is incredible or i find prop makers on instagram other, because you know, it's not like you go to Walmart and bump into somebody who makes props or something. <laughs> so to find other prop makers and to get to talk to them. So there's definitely more good that comes off of Instagram, but I do have to say, my family and I have a lot of good jokes <laughs> off of some of the advice <laughs> that we get off of Instagram. We have good, funny conversations over quite a bit of it. <laughs> Social media, it's a wonderful. It is. <laughs> So, my bucket list is to get to Oshkosh. My my uncle used to fly in every year, and I haven't I haven't managed to do it yet. But you've just come back. Yes. How was it this year? Because it's it's is this first year back or second year? Second back year back. But you have to go. Second back. You you absolutely <laughs> like you you can't not go. I tell people this. I mean. Uh, some people's like, well, I don't really have a place to stay. Stay in your car. It doesn't matter. You have to get to Oshkosh. <laughs> Whatever you have to do, you have to go. So I think this is like 30, 31 years I've been going. So we, we go as a family. We're talking whole family, kids, dogs, parents, my brother. Like, you name it. We ask everybody to come with us. We're like, everybody needs to come to Oshkosh. You guys got to see this. <laughs> so we love it. This year... It was good. Um, they put up a, uh, a tent for women in aviation, which was great. They had a lot of good. They had, um, I think it's, it's Ghost Riders. Ghost Rider, he did the sky riding all through the day. But at the nighttime fireworks show, it looked like he was flying through the fireworks. And it was one of the coolest Whoa. things it was absolutely awesome. That was one of our favorite parts. And then in the ultralight area, they have uh, the powered parachutes that are all lit up around their cage. And they do some aerobatics and things like that. That was also one of my favorite. And of course, Aeroshell is my favorite. They're all my favorite. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> I love watching them. But it was a, uh, they said, a lot of people said they just had a ton of traffic. It was really good. I mean, everybody's happy. EAA does such a good job. Um, so it was great. I, I get to judge. I volunteer to be an EAA judge for the ultralight area. I got to see an incredible Murphy Renegade. So now I want one of those. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, the quality of craftsmanship that's there is just incredible. The amount of knowledge, the amount of, of aviation knowledge that's there is just unreal. Do you walk around that, that bit going? <laughs> you know, I don't have a lot there, probably because most of my stuff, well, a fair amount goes on open cockpit airplanes. So they generally, I don't think they fly them, you know, but that far maybe or for that long a time. So anyway, I'd, I had maybe, I did have probably five or six on the field. And so I went and talked to the customers and said hi and saw them in person and that kind of thing. So that was great. So that was, that was good. But I love looking at everybody else's propellers, actually, also. <laughs> you appeared on the um, the Women Building Aviation panel, which I've seen lots of pictures pop up, of, but it, I haven't seen the actual thing yet. How was it? Because it looks like it was fascinating. Well, there was a lady from Boeing on there, and she was impressive. 
and they recorded it and it's supposed to be available soon. They're going to release the recording of it. So it was pretty incredible. Like I got up there, I was like, what, how did I get on here with these girls? (laughs) (laughs) And uh, so, and I, I, when she asked me to, I was kind of nervous. So I started taking speaking engagements at like um, the local EAA chapters and things like that to get ready for it because I didn't want to be, you know, nervous and things. So, and, um, we, I, I have a very great group of friends. And so, uh, like half of my campground came to see it and, and so many friends. And so they're like, what's the best part about aviation? I'm like, the people. And I'm crying because I'm like, <laughs> all my friends came. <laughs> but, but it's true. So it was, it was a really, really great experience. And I do believe that Boeing is going to, um, put out the recording of it and, those ladies were super impressive. So it'd definitely be something that would be fun to watch. <laughs> fantastic. I'll keep an eye out for that. This has been fantastic. <laughs> Thank you so much for, for spending some time with me and talking about what you yeah. do. Yeah. Well, thanks for um, asking me. And I can't wait to start, you know, listening to your podcast because I'm excited. <laughs> Thank you. I cannot thank Elena Lewis enough for joining me on the Damn Casters. As you can see, the passion and the craft that goes into making those propellers comes from a wellspring of family and a love for the job that they do. In the description, I put the links to the Culver Props Instagram feed so you can give them a follow. Of course, if you need a propeller, you now know where to go because where else would you want to go if you need a propeller for your build? Next time, we are joined by author Kenneth Katz, whose new book, The Supersonic Bone, looks at the development and the incredible politics around the Rockwell B-1B Lancer bomber. It's a two-parter because we deep dive into it, and I cannot wait to share it with you. If you have enjoyed the podcast and would like to support us going forward, you can via Patreon. From just £3 a month plus VAT, you'll get all of our episodes on a dedicated feed, ad-free, and before they head out to the rest of the world. There's also a Discord server where you can chat to me about all things aviation related, what's coming up for the podcast, and ask questions for upcoming guests as well. You'll also get a hand-scrolled thank you postcard from me, designed by aircraft.co.uk, to say, well, thanks. You can find our Patreon page in the link in the description below. Thank you for your support, and until next time, do take care of yourselves. The Damcasters is hosted and produced by Matt Bone. And it is a Boney Abroad podcast production. To check out our other podcasts, head to boneyabroad.com. <laughs>